Hello, and welcome to the 2015 NASA PM Challenge. My name is Ramy and Pierre, and I'm with NASA's Academy for Program Project and Engineering Leadership. Today's session is about building your systems mentality, using systems engineering and integration to solve project challenges. And our presenter today is Bo Bamak. Bo was program director for NASA's Space Shuttle Program, Orbiter. He was manager for Sea Launch Operations and Development. He chaired the Standing Review Board for NASA Constellation. And in 2006, he retired from the Boeing Company. At the end of today's session, during the final portion, we'll have a question and answer with Bo. You'll be able to submit your questions anytime during this session by using the thought bubble in the lower right-hand corner of the virtual challenge player, or by using the hashtag VPMC using your preferred social media. Bo, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. It's nice to be part of your VPMC. Thank you. Great. So let's start right at the beginning. Sure. What is systems engineering and integration, and why should it matter to project managers? Well, it's a very good question. Why should it matter to project managers? First of all, for those of you who are already project managers, I want to congratulate you. Some, you already have demonstrated your leadership and ability to get things done, and somebody has recognized it, so congratulations. For those of you who aspire to be project managers, I want to congratulate you on your, on your ambition. And for those of you who don't want to be either or are not, I, I think what you will see is that embracing and learning and using system in engineering integration is going to enhance your career no matter which direction you choose. And as far, why is it important to, to project managers? What is it first and then why yeah. is it important? Well, system engineering and integration is a discipline that spans throughout the, every piece of the system. Frequently, pieces are built, in, a system is built in pieces. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example, like Space Shuttle, we can use ESD as well, but Space Shuttle. You have a program manager who is in charge of the whole program. His program is executed in pieces. The, each piece is typically built by different NASA center. Mm -hmm. Each NASA center has a, its own technical culture, technical uh, leadership, is led by very powerful people. So there is a, a, a natural tendency to have a, some level of isolation between centers. Okay. What makes this even more challenging is the fact that each center is supported by a contractor. Now these are also very powerful entities and they are in competition with each other. So they are not very eager to change the information and data between those supporting, let's say, one center with that supporting another center. Okay. But ultimately, all these pieces have to be brought together, <laughs> typically at the launch site, assembled, checked out, and fly to space. And you, as a program, program or project manager, are responsible for the whole thing, even though the whole system is built in pieces. That's why you need system engineering and integration, because system engineering and integration spans across all those pieces, bring them together, provides bridges so that to make sure that they all fly and work in harmony and, work and do it safely when it's time to fly. Okay, let's talk about shuttle in particular. How did systems engineering and integration work during your time on shuttle? I'll be happy to do that. I'll show you, I'll show you a chart which, show, which demonstrate to you the, the breadth and the depth of the system engineering integration on space shuttle. This is only part of SENI. And by the way, if I use terminology SENI or system engineering integration or system integration, I mean, I mean the same thing okay. effectively. But here's an example of the breadth of the system engineering and integration of shuttle. Shuttle is a system, a whole system, built in pieces, remember, mm -hmm. yes. by different centers. System engineering and integration had to do this in-depth analysis of everything you see on this chart. And this is in a configuration when the shuttle is on the ground at KSC, then in the configuration when shuttle flies through this first stage regime, and finally what we call boost configuration after you shed the solid booster. 
but each of those configurations has to be analyzed. And you're talking about disciplines like lift of loads, structural loads due to lift off, uh, ground winds and response of the vehicle to ground winds as it sways, make sure that there is enough clearance between that, you know, 300 plus feet vehicle and the tower, uh, the acoustics, ET pressurization, external tank pressurization, electrical power, electric, all of these technical disciplines have to be involved, involved, have to be invoked to analyze the entire system so you can arrive at the design requirements that could be given to each of the centers to design their piece of your, of the space shuttle. Okay. So, so we have a little video we're going to show now. Yes, we are going to show you a little 30 seconds of video of what looks like a perfectly nice, very successful, and it was very successful, flight of STS-1. This is STS-1 on the launch pad, and here it comes in flight. T minus 15, 14, 13, T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. America's first space shuttle, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. Well, that brought some nice memories from STS-1. Incidentally, that, that launch occurred on my birthday. Oh, okay. My birthday is April 12th, and I was, I'm still grateful to NASA for helping celebrate my birthday by launching <laughs> STS-1 on my birthday. So thank you very much. So you said, you told us that was going to be a very smooth looking yeah. launch. Yes. But you have told me that there were some very specific threats to shuttle yes. that were encountered during STS-1. Yes. And in, in, uh, we have we are showing on the chart the first anomaly that we have, that we saw. So shuttle flies. You, you saw the liftoff. Looks very benign. Looks very smooth. And it was it was a huge success. Shuttle was a very complex undertaking. And it was a project of of national significance. It was during Cold War. We wanted to make sure it worked, and it worked just just fine. But so we come back, you know, after mission is over, we land, and we start looking at the data. Okay. And, and we observe that one ma first major anomaly was uh, SRB, booster ignition over pressure. What, what that involves is when the booster ignites, there is a huge pressure wave emanating from the exit plane of the, of the solid booster engine and it envelopes the entire shuttle, and it sort of rattles, shakes the vehicle. And it was, it was much more violent than we anticipated. Okay. We did analysis and testing, and what we saw in flight was much more, much more violent and much more complex. And so we, we looked at the measurement of accelerations on wing, on the aft of the vehicle, on forward part of the vehicle, and we see loads, exceedances everywhere, you know, in fact, in the forward fuselage, which is about here, there, there are some, uh, in front of forward fuselage, nitrogen tetroxide 38 inch sphere, the, the struts that supports that, that sphere buckled. They failed in buckling. Okay. And, and you know, this is not a, a trivial, a little uh, anomaly because uh, it, we are, it contains about half a ton of very poisonous uh, nitrogen tetroxide and that it's a, a propellant that is needed for on-orbit control of orbiter. So that was a major anomaly. So, so what did we do? Okay, so you, you know you have exceedances of load exceedances in many parts of the orbiter. The problem is originating from the exit plane of the solid booster. So cho what choices do you have for resolution? You can redesign the orbiter, which is not very practical, would have probably taken two or three years, and it would probably threaten vi viability of existence of shuttle. Mm -hmm. You can try to redesign that start rise rate of the booster ignition. That's another two years, or alternately would be at two years to do that. So that's a non-starter. So 
what do you do? You go to the system engineering and integration and say, guys, find me a system solution which will save the orbiter, save the star transient of the booster, and allow us to fly STS-2. Okay, so the solution to the problem that was expressed at the top of the orbiter actually was where? The solution finally wound up, and let me just show you the next chart. We have, we, we of course, we had a, we couldn't fly STS-2 without corrective actions. We okay. couldn't do it. So we, we, we gathered our finest minds, you know, from system engineering. We created this wave committee. Uh, we we, we uh, went back to our 6.4% 6, 6 model and started to do a testing and did a whole bunch of analysis. And final fix was injecting a massive amount of water into the, at the launch pad, into the exit plane of the SRB to quench the thermal energy and absorb kinetic energy of these gases okay. to mitigate this explosive nature of that wave that emanated from, from the exit of plane of the, of, the, uh, of the booster. Because we, our self-confidence <laughs> was a little bit shaken up, we sort of t t taken belts and uh, suspenders approach. In addition to this massive amount of water, you can see on the chart we, uh, these, these red water troughs they have like plastic water throws hanging under the exit plane of the nozzle. They also contain a amount of water. And that also absorbs thermal and kinetic energy of the gases. So solutions of what was the final fix? Redirected the water spray and put the water trough. We were able to leave the orbiter alone and, and leave the ignition properties of the of booster without changing. And we have achieved very significant uh, reduction in dissolver pressure. This picture on the left saw STS-1 co configuration, which wound up in this uh, STS uh, buck buckled strut tank in this forward part of the fuselage. And after we redirected, you can see that we are uh, throwing about 100,000 gallons per minute of water into the exit plane, and that solved the overpressure ignition for STS-1. And we flew every, every flight ever since in that configuration with this additional water and these water troughs hanging under the exit plane. And just to wrap it up, uh, this shows, the, the, the picture shows that the pressure differential in the back of the orbiter across the elevon, and you can see the STS-1 on top was very significant, several pounds per square inch delta P, which caused a, 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 these excessive loads and the uh, STS-1 with all this water uh, was, uh, was very benign. So, okay, in bottom line, so what was the role of system engineering approach? We preserve the orbiter without redesign. We preserve the SRB star transient. Both of them would have been prohibitively, it would have been a massive impact to the program. And, uh, and we were able to fly it safely simply by injecting water into the <laughs> exit plane of the, of the SRB nozzle. And all that happened between STS-1 and STS-2. Yes. Yeah. And it avoided the, this massive impact to the schedule and, and, and probably a threat to the existence of, you know, continuance of shuttle program. So the first five shuttle launch missions were actually seen as orbital test flights. Four, yes. Four. Yeah, so yeah, that gave yeah. NASA a chance to test assumptions, test the predictions right. from, from the yes. models. Yes. Besides the ignition overpressure issue, what other programmatic threats were realized well, during uh, STS-1? Yeah. Fun usually is, is more dimensions. But, you know, I just described to you an event that happened right at liftoff. This is like you ignite the SRB and you have this, this situation that, that we just went through. Shuttle ascends, you know, on that picture you saw, second, about 60 seconds after liftoff, you go through this uh, regime called maximum dynamic pressure regime, okay. which is about 60 seconds. At that time, you are flying somewhere between Mach 1 and, uh, and 1.25, 1 and a quarter. Okay. And, and, it's, it actually, it, it, and what it is is just simply resistance of, of the air of, of, uh, that you fly through at high velocity. It gives you a big aerodynamic loads on the vehicle. And in that, after landing, we noticed that we have an incredible amount of, 
of additional lift on the orbiter lift that we didn't expect. Okay. It was, it was, and you know, lift creates structural loads and we, we have very significant negative margin on the wing. We didn't break anything, thanks to God. So we had, uh, so let me describe you that, that, that anomaly. And so, and we finally, after evaluation of, of, the, of the flight data, we see huge lift on the wing and because the wing is aft of the center of gravity of the shuttle, the, the shuttle got canted a little bit in flight, and we actually flew very close to this uh, range safety boundary, which is not a pleasant thought for the astronauts, because, you know, when you violate the boundary, there is somebody holds a finger on a button, you know. Uh, so we didn't touch it, thanks to God, but okay. we were close to it. So it was a serious anomaly. And, and it was traced to the fact that the wind tunnel testing prior to flight was done with cold gases. We, we, the flight told us that hot gases expand differently. And maybe with today's modeling techniques, people would, would know it. And, you know, state of the art at that time didn't exist to allow us to correctly predict this, uh, this wing lift. So, uh, so the question, now you have another challenge to orbiter. You have... The whole back of the orbiter, it has a, uh, especially the lifting surfaces, which is wings, control surfaces, they all have negative margins. And what do you do? Do you, do you really start talking about redesigning the orbiter wing? Orbiter wing is a massive piece of structure. You know, it's about, at the root, is about six feet tall, and, and redesigning the wing and redesigning the elevons and actuators would have, again, been prohibitive. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do? We turn to our SCNI friends. We turn to people who, have, who think system, who don't think if you have excessive stresses in a wing, the fixes make it stronger. No, no. that is not normally the linear thinking. This is a, if, you, if the stresses are excessive for the, for the given strength, you give it more strength. Well that may not be the most effective solution. In fact, the system person would say, look at the whole system. How do I relieve stresses in that wing without making it stronger? So let me, let me describe what, what our team has done. If you look at the space shuttle in flight during this maximum dynamic pressure regime, we have STS-1 was flown with straight up without any canting, without any angle, or at least that's what we thought we were going to do. Which means that when the vehicle, when the angle of attack, and I'm sure a lot of you knows what I'm talking about, is zero for the whole vehicle, the local wing angle of attack is about six degrees. You get significant wing lift at six degrees angle of attack for the wing. To make it worse, we had this anomaly, aerodynamic anomaly, which essentially doubled that, that wing lift. That's okay. what caused us problem. So the clever guys, and, I, and I'm so proud of, of that team, they said, you know, maybe the solution to the wing problem is not tearing up the wing and making it stronger. How about if we fly a shuttle with a slightly negative angle of attack through that high pressure regime and reduce the wing lift? In other words, if, let's say if you flew this thing at the negative six degrees, the wing, the wing angle of attack would be zero. You would have no wing lift. That, unfortunately, was not compatible with the rest of the shuttle. Like, for okay. example, orbital windows had problems. Some skin of the tank, side pressures would be excessive. So we found a sweet spot, or you can think of it as a sweet spot, or spot of the minimum misery, whichever way you prefer. We found that if you fly during max Q at minus 3.2 degrees, you save the wing and you don't mess up the windows and you don't mess up the tank. And we did a lot of analysis, and 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 this is like a, to me it's a it's a classic example of system mentality, system level mentality, and system level approach to resolving a problem. You have a stress problem. Solution is not give it more strength. Solution is fly differently. Mm. That, was a, that was a very elegant solution. And uh, so, and, you know, some people may 
people question how ingenious it was. It was clever at least, you know. And change of attack, eliminate the problem to acceptable level, avoid extensive wing redesign, and avoid unacceptable schedule impact. Again, redesigning orbital wing and retesting, that's another multiple years, you know, uh, activity, and we didn't have to do it. All right, so that was a case where the system-wide solution had to not negatively impact other areas of the yes. design. Yes, that's very important because you can, you can solve a problem by creating another problem. The trick was here, solve the wing over stress problem without really designing the wing and w without creating a problem anywhere else. in shuttle. Okay. And we were able to do this by using this system level approach and system level mentality uh, by trying to solve a specific problem in wing by doing something away from the wing. wing. All right. Now, all of shuttle's problems or challenges didn't happen during flight. No, you've, that's, you've, that's, that's correct. You've talked about some challenges that actually happened yes, in pre-flight. I have one more example for you that, uh, <laughs> interesting, it kick-started my career as a program manager. Uh, what I, I'll show you a chart. Uh, the, we, before STS-1, some analysis started to show a problem on the, on the dome of the tank. And uh, it, it, I'll briefly describe how the, how the shuttle is stacked at KSC. First of all, you, 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 put, you, you install the solid boosters on the platform. Then you introduce the tank on the crane between the two. First, you made the forward interfaces. And then you made the aft interfaces. And then you hang the orbiter on it. And you, you, you roll out to, to the launch pad. Okay. What happens when you, when you go to the launch pad and start fueling, you flip fuel uh, tank from the bottom. The, the cold liquid hydrogen shrinks everything. And you know, this is a 27 foot diameter tank. It shrinks at the cold temperature of uh, liquid hydrogen, shrinks radially one inch, one inch. And it would be okay except in this plane uh, with SRBs, SRBs won't allow the tank to shrink. So that shrinks in this direction, but not in this direction. And like the picture shows, become an oval. Mm -hmm. And what that oval shape does is crinkles the dome of the, of the tank, and it's elastic, it doesn't break, it, you don't fail. But what it does when you develop this crinkling of these gourd, dome gores, the insulation cracks and fall off. Okay. And you, don't, you must have that insulation to protect the bottom of the tank during flight from radiant heating of the, from the engines. So uh, the question is, OK, so now you're starting to say, my God, do it, what do I do? Redesign the tank bottom. And by the way, that 27-inch circle I'm showing, there, there is a ring frame which is about 40-inch deep, massive ring frame. You would have to have that ring frames so much stronger to be able to resist, to, to be able to deflect the solids, bend the solids so that you don't create this, this oval. It would have been a terrible undertaking. So, you, so we know from your previous two examples that redesigning is not the answer. What was the answer? So who comes to the rescue? ASCNI, System Engineering and Integration again. And, and this is one that I, it's like, as I told you, it was like, I was a young engineer. I was actually afraid to propose a solution, but, but people liked it because it was simple. And, you know, simplicity is uh, a wonderful thing at times. So, okay. So we, you, we don't want to redesign the tank. It's an awful, you know, we've got this 40-inch deep frame that would have to be, you would, you would have to add, and by the way, Tank almost flies to orbit. 94% of the weight you put on tank trades for payload weight. And, and performance was a huge, uh, you know, huge quest at the, during development phase. So we suggested, hey, why don't we put these belly bands? And, you know, belly bands in aerospace industry sounds like, you know, primitive solution, but it's simple. 
After you made the forward interface, you stretched the SRBs apart with these belly bands, made this aft interface with some struts, because we have some mating struts, and then released the load from these belly bands, and you pre-compress the tank in the opposite direction that I showed you on the previous picture. What it means is that later when it shrinks, it becomes almost a circle. And you have to be very careful. You have to do a lot of analysis. You, again, you don't want to solve one problem and create another. another. But that's what we did. So we, uh, we, we, so our solution was, you know, don't redesign the tank. Don't st try to pressurize. Because you can actually eliminate this crinkly by putting pressure on the tank. But now you're talking performance impact. And now you're talking about worrying about skin of the, of the tank, you know, to be able to extend additional pressure. So, uh, so, so we did this without impacting the tank by simply modifying the mating procedure. And that got me promoted to program manager. So <laughs> one thing, one thought that for you, either aspiring or, or current program or project managers, try to do something that solves a major problem while eyes are on you, because people will notice. Maybe I was just lucky, but that's what happened to me, and I was, I was promoted to program manager at Rockwell of the system integration. So the take-home lesson from these three examples, yes. uh, take-home lessons, look for a system-wide solution to a site-specific problem. Yes. Make sure the solution, the fix for the, for the problem doesn't cause you problems someplace else in the system. I wish you were there when I was young. We could have done it together. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, don't, uh, a simple solution is often the yes. most elegant. Yes. Belly bands yeah. may not be yeah. high tech, but they yeah. address the issue. When I proposed these belly bands, I thought, they'll, they'll, they'll yeah. laugh at me. They'll you. throw me out. <laughs> you know? They looked at it and said, we can do it. It's easy. You know, it's easier to put belly bands than designing some hydraulic contraption that will you know, exert these loads on the solid, so. Because you have the cost so, of that yeah. redesign. But the bottom line is, don't try to look only at the location of the problem and think the solution is there. Because the most cost-effective solution could be 100 feet away. Now, that's a challenge for engineers, because yeah. engineers like to fix problems in front of them. The engineers like, you know, a proud stress guy, if he has a stress problem, he wants to fix with the additional strength. More strength. The guy, a stress guy with system mentality will look around the whole system and say, how I can solve my stress problem without putting additional strength in the, in the vehicle. Okay. See? And that's what uh, SENI mentality and SENI approach can do for, did for us and can do for, for you program managers out there in the audience. So those were three SENI examples from Shuttle, but right. that's not all of your experience with an aerospace. That's, that's true, yeah. So what we have here is a video. Can you talk us through what we're going to see? Oh, we are going to show the EFT flights that, that just happened recently with Orion and Delta Four Heavy. And uh, can we run that video right now? Yes, so let's run the video and then we'll do some more yeah. talking. So we've been talking about shuttle, right? but one of the things I want to move us into is can we talk a little bit about how SCNI differs between government com programs and commercial? Sure. Sure. We can, we can do the three things here. We can look at the, the way shuttle e SCNI was executed, mm -hmm. the way it's being executed on ESD, mm -hmm. and then I'll bring in a commercial uh, exposure that I had in Sea Launch. So we can, we can look at all of those three. So, you know, uh, here, is, here is a compa comparison of SENI organization and functions between exploration system, which is a current NASA massive undertaking, and space shuttle, which was also a previous uh, huge undertaking. And you can see on the on the exploration system, you have ESD manager at the top of this org chart. 
You had a program manager on shuttle. They're essentially equivalent. Uh, each one is on, on the bottom row of this, you can see that three programs, SLS, the big rocket, Orion, the capsule, and the ground system, GSDO, we call it, on, for, for the ESD. And between the two, there is a cross-program system integration. Okay. This is the equivalent of SENI. On the shuttle, likewise, we had program manager, we have five projects, you know, the orbiter, the ET, SRB, and, and main engines, and we had a system integration, which is the NASA uh, organizational unity. Mm -hmm. It's supported by integration contractor. That, that's how it was organized. I ran that contract at Rockwell. I was a program manager. That's a job I got after I fixed that problem with the crinkling of the dome, you know, by putting belly Good bands. Answer. And uh, so it, 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 let's, let's look at the similarity and differences. The differences really, we have, in both cases, we have an SENI. And in, and in both cases, we have entities that produces, produce major piece of hardware. And let's go on the next chart, and we would uh, discuss a little bit about uh, what, the, what are the similarities and what are the differences. And, and, and you can see on Space Shuttle, we had an independent office. SENI was an independent office mm -hmm. reporting to program managers, and it, gets its, and it has its own funding to do the SENI work. And uh, on ESD, we also have a cross-program integration reporting for, for a ESD, but the funding is only for a, a, a relatively small managerial activity of, of SENI. Okay. And we'll get to how it's actually the, the work is being done. Uh, let's go back to the space shuttle again. NASA managed SENI, supported by yours truly, my team mm -hmm. of integration contractor. The NASA is managed SCNI, but that management is shared between the cross-program integration team and the three programs. Okay. It's a different structure. Uh, system, Do you system, have a preference for which is better, the more centralized structure or shuttle or the federated model? Uh, well, ESD? I'm not ready to answer that. Okay. Maybe I have a, but you know what, because I want to go show you another chart. I want to bring you to show you what I've learned when I went to build Sea Launch. Okay. Because uh, it may guide you, guide me to answer your question. All right. Okay. The bottom level of this, the system level work was performed by integration contractor, and system level uh, work is distributed among three programs. So it's different the way uh, SENI work is done. It's not all the difference the way it's managed. So. Raymond asked me a question, which one do you prefer? Well, my, my first you know, reaction would be, well, I, I've, I've ran this SCNI job for about 12 or 13 years, so of course I liked it. I got to like it after so many years. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and this is, <laughs> this is one of those cases. So let me show you what I, when Boeing acquired space business from Rockwell, they, they, they heard me talk uh, with an accent. They figured, well, the guy probably speaks pretty good Russian, so they asked me to go to Russia to build sea launch. My, my Russian wasn't all that bad, at, uh, all, this, all that good at the time. But it got better when I lived in St. Petersburg. So let, 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 let me, let's take a look at what, what I found on Shuttle. Okay, so here, by the sea launch, let me, can I spend uh, 30 yes, seconds describe describing? Yes, describe for us what is sea launch. Sea launch was a joint venture between Boeing Company uh, a Russian company, Energia, Ukrainian company, Yuznoye, and, and a Norwegian company, Kvarner. They are marine people, ships people. So this time, instead of having multiple centers, you have multiple countries. Multiple, uh, uh, yeah, speaking different languages, by okay. the way, you know, to make it a little more exciting. So, uh, so, I, so they asked me to go, and I saw I inherited two ships, a big platform and a command and control ship, and this, this rocket, uh, which is built by, by, top is built by Boeing. It's a fairing that contains uh, spacecraft, commercial spacecraft. Incidentally, this is no involvement from government. This is all commercial okay. uh, undertaking. And so Boeing was in charge of integrating payload to the, to, the, to the payload unit and their fairing. The next level down is Russian Energia, you see, 
that they, they, they were integration on the right side, you see, of the chart, integrating their third stage, which they provide, to the Boeing peace payload unit. Okay. And then you move down on that rocket. Ukrainians provide first and second stage, and they are in charge of integrating their two stages with the rest of the Russians and Americans. And when I got to the program, and I come with the shuttle bias, you know, because I spent 12 years working it in that fashion, I didn't like that. And, you know, and, and, and I, we had no integration contractor. The integration job was divided among providers of the hardware. A little bit like ESD. Yes. You know, so very different so, model than shuttle. So, you know, my first reaction was, well, I got to change that. And then you start yourself asking a question. Do I really want to change something 180 degree, making 180 degree turn when I have a deadline staring me in the face? Or do I make this work? And I made this work. Okay. And I, you know, and like I say, uh, and, I'm, and you ask me a question, you know, I think if you have a qualified, dedicated people, right attitude, you can make most of these schemes work. Some are perhaps easier, some are not as easy or convenient, but you can make. I made this work. This is much lower, yeah. smaller scale than shuttle. Yes. But I came with a shuttle bias, and I made this integration on Ceylon's work, in spite of the fact that we had no integration contractor and the pieces were divided into the providers of the hardware. So having a systems-minded person in charge of SCNI is the first step, but is that all that's required to make this model work? Well, it's a little more than that. You, uh, you have to have somebody in charge of system integration who knows system integration mm -hmm. or, is, or he's embracing it, has an attitude that I'm going to make this work and, and has to have an organization and has to have resources. And, uh, and, you, and you as a program manager, you depend on these guys. You depend on these guys to solve these problems that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't flown much yet. We have, you know, flight tests on uh, Delta IV Heavy. We haven't flown much yet. You know, we have threat uh, Ares, you know, Ares 1X, uh, the, the experiment. I mean, that was since the shuttle. We haven't flown a lot. Yes. But you will be flying, and, uh, and, and, and you probably will be experiencing problems. And please have SCNI standing by to help you solve these problems. So you don't wind up redesigning big things in the areas where you don't have to. Okay. Where you don't have to. You know, people sometimes think, uh, well, I can redesign something for five million dollars. But if you stand down a program for half a year, even though that redesign may cost you five million dollars. There's the cost if of If your spend down. rate is two billion a year, you just you just spend a billion dollars on that uh, on that little delay. So you really have to think in terms of uh, it's not only what that specific redesign would cost me, what impact would it create to the entire program. Again, big picture thinking. So that's what this all, this presentation seems to boil down to, not looking at the parts, but looking at the whole. That's, you know, like, as I said, you know, when we started this conversation, Ramian, when you are a program manager, you, you in, first of all, you know, you inherit things. Like I inherit sea launch. I, I mean, you know, it, we rarely in our careers, we get promoted, okay? And God bless you. I work on your, you know, do good things so you can get promoted. When you get promoted, you get into a job that somebody else had before you. They already established things. Your first inclination is, well, I'm going to do it my way, okay? If something is so broke that it doesn't work, you, you may not have a choice. Be very careful. I learned that something when I was serving on Augustine Committee with Norm Augustine. If you switch something to something new, <laughs> make sure that that new thing is so much better on paper than the one you're walking away from. Because a year from now, you will find some scars on the new thing that won't look quite as good as it did on paper. Mm. So, my, so my, my point here is be careful making a big, massive shift because you don't like what you inherited. That's right. Make the system that you make inherited the system work. if you can. You may have no choice. If something is so broken and so uh, unfunctional that you don't have any choice, you might. But like I said, be careful to making a 180 degree turns. Okay. 
So can you talk a little bit about the relationship between SCNI and safety? Well, you know, uh, part of, okay, safety, you know, safety is non-negotiable. We, uh, you know, we can negotiate content, we can negotiate schedule, mm -hmm. although schedule, you have to be careful with schedule because schedule is very visible. Content is not that visible. You know, if you, uh, if you have, if you compromise on payload capability a little bit or or, or, or some, put some limits on when you can launch, when you can nod, or wind restriction. You know, few uh, people on the program will understand that, but, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but the broader public won't, won't even notice it. But if you slip something a year, you know, it's very easy to see. But safety is one of those things that if you don't do safety right and something bad happens, you, it, it's all visible. So, so uh, you know, Safety is, 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 is non-negotiable. SCNI has a huge role in safety. Each element, you know, these systems that are building pieces, yes. each piece, they look at their own safety aspects. Make sure the thing doesn't catch on fire, that it doesn't break and kill people, that it doesn't, catch, that it doesn't fail and create, a, you know, a catastrophe. They all, they all do for their piece of hardware. SCNI has an overlaying role. You look at all these pieces, when you bring them together, are you creating some new hazards? Mm -hmm. One has a mixture of propellant, the other brings a spark. Each one alone is inconsequential. You bring them together, you, you can have a, you know, explosion. So system integration is very important. We, we do these things called integrated hazards. You look at the hazards that you create by bringing the pieces together and make sure that these hazards are either controlled or designed out or, or if they are reasonable, you, of course, you, you, you have to accept them. But yes, SCNI plays a big role in safety. Excellent. I'm going to remind our viewers that you may submit a question at any time for Bo. We'll do a Q&A very shortly. You could submit that question by using the thought bubble, which is in the lower right-hand corner of the virtual PM Challenge player, or you could submit it using the hashtag VPMC via your, your preferred social media. So I have another question for you. Can you talk sure. about SENI specifically as it, as it relates to cost and okay. schedule? Well, this is, you know, you, you, when you manage a program, you have, you have Technical content, you have cost and schedule. And, and technical content, if it's not done, done right, can result in a safety problem. Mm -hmm. But a uh, program manager has a challenge, and, and it's and it's never-ending challenge. When you have a problem, you, you depend on SCNI, find you the most cost and most schedule-effective solution. Because remember the example I gave you, which is not, was not, I just invented that example. Low cost corrective action mm -hmm. that delays a program for a long time, the true cost is huge. The cost of a repair or, or corrective action is small, but the impact to the program is huge. So, so SCNI has a role as looking across the whole system and helping program manager to find the more, most, not only cost, but schedule effective solution. And that's what we have attempted to do on the shuttle when I described, you know, this uh, looking for a solution to the wing without spending three years redesigning the wing. Spending, you know, a few months to creating water injection rather than redesigning the, the half of the orbiter. And SCNI can play a big role if it's there. In other conversations, I've heard you talk about how analysis is fairly inexpensive. Oh, that's the, they, they, yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, when you're an analyst, you think you're spending a lot of money, you know, analyzing things. Believe me, it's trivial compared to cost of changing hardware. In fact, you know, analysis, you know, and like I say, when, you, if, when you're a program manager, you'll find that analysis is relatively cheap compared to that you know, to the cost of uh, uh, hardware changes. Mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned in other conversations how, how just how large the SCNI function was during a shuttle. Yes. Um, 
and how there's always a temptation when things are going well to perhaps uh, cut some yeah. corners in that area. Yeah. You, you're touching on a, on a sensitive area, but I'll be happy to participate with you. I appreciate it. The measurement, and in fact, Mike Griffin said it more than once, and I agree with him. The measure of success of SENI is not the success of SENI itself. It's success of the entire enterprise or entire program. You don't have an excellent and successful SENI, unless the pieces that people are building with your data, with your assistance, with your guidance, with your requirements definition, are successful. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, because of that, successful SENI is not always visible. Mm -hmm. Success of the program overshadows this, the participation of SENI. So temptation temptation is to when things go well when things go well cut back on SENI mm -hmm. because they don't produce hardware if some hardware guy has a failure in in a qual test and you have to redo that test after redesign and he needs money temptation is to take it from SENI give it to that guy who just broke a piece of hardware mm -hmm. because you think that is more urgent and 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 you have to be very careful of that and and I've said it many times uh, you know, when I was talking about lessons from shuttle development. Mm -hmm. We had two heartbreaking events on the life of shuttle when we had two accidents. Of course. After every accident, shuttle revitalized system integration on shuttle and, and put a powerful new manager in charge. And what I'm suggesting is be mindful when things are going well don't think that you, you can start skimming over SENI and don't get caught like we did on Space Shuttle. Can you give us a sense of how, uh, how many people or how much of the total budget was being spent on SENI during Will that time? Were you asking me to dig in my memory, but uh, Raymond, for you, for you <laughs> I'll dig in my memory. When I was running integration uh, in, at Rockwell, yes. we were about 8% of Rockwell's business. SENI as a SCNI function. SENI and Orbiter. Okay. Orbiter was much more massive. Yes. We were eight eight percent of, uh, of 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 total. Rockwell was approximately, and this is, I hope nobody sells me email, sells me, oh no, you missed on it. We were about half of the total of shuttle program during the development. We were building orbiters, much more complicated, you know, uh, uh, tank. Uh, ground system and boosters, I'm, I'm estimating it at the other half, mm -hmm. which means that we were 8% uh, of Rockwell or about 4% of the total shuttle cost. Okay. You know, so that was about scale. And, uh, you know, and you have to do it. Don't overdo it. Don't underdo it. Just remember, that if you remember that SCNI is, is enabler and assistance to the people who build hardware and make sure that this hardware is built to right requirements so it finally shows up at the loan site and is put together and it flies. It not only flies, but it flies safely. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned don't overdo it, don't underdo it. Right. What would overdoing SENI look like? Your questions are getting tougher. <laughs> uh, well, like I told you, I gave you a little scale, and I think I think shuttle was was pretty well balanced. Okay, so know? about that four yeah. percent. I would say, I'd say if you stick around four percent of the total, you are. Uh, and, and there's another another element to it: complexity of the system, how intertwined these pieces are. Shuttle was more integrated, more intertwined than, for example, SLS is. SLS has relatively simple interfaces between itself, between rocket and Orion mm -hmm. in flight. But on the ground, though, during pre-launch and propellant loading, it, it's, uh, it's uh, the SLS slash Orion and ground system has about as much complexity as a shuttle. So, you, okay. so using my metrics of 4% if you, if you like that number, uh, you have to also look at the complexity of what you're integrating. How many interfaces do you have? How many umbilicals? You don't have to. 
how many integrated analysis from this first chart you have to do, how many different configurations you fly, yes. and that will define essentially the size of your team to do uh, SCNI properly. Okay. I'm sorry my questions are getting harder. In a few minutes, I'm going to let folks from the audience, our viewers, ask their questions. Again, if you have questions for Bo, you could submit them at any time using the VPMC player, the thought bubble in the lower right-hand corner, or by using the hashtag AskVPMC via your preferred social media. And I'm fair game, guys. You know, I'm sitting here. I, you, can, you can ask whatever you want. So we've been talking a lot about human space flight in SCNI. Does SCNI always also apply in the same ways to unmanned missions? Yes. Very good point. You know, the, the sea launch was unmanned. Hmm. Oh, and, and what you find is that, uh, that functions that you have to, if you build a launch system, whether it's manned or unmanned, now manned has additional demand, especially in the area of safety treatment. But the basic engineering integration functions are very similar, mm -hmm. almost identical. And, and, I, and I actually do have a chart for you, Raymond, that might satisfy what you're talking about. And it's this picture. I have shuttle, I have SLS Orion, and I have sea launch. Mm -hmm. Different beasts. The first two speaking English language. <laughs> the third one speaking Russian, Ukrainian, English, and a little bit Norwegian. Okay, but if you look at the integration functions and in each of the system is almost identical, almost identical. Mm -hmm. The first two are man, man rated, the third one is not man rated. And yet, what you need to do in terms of analysis, in terms of checkup, checkout, uh, in, ter in terms of management of interfaces between them, it's very similar regardless of what language they speak and uh, how they look. Okay, excellent. So I have a few questions from some of our viewers. Okay. All right, uh, I'll start with this. This question is from Mike. How did you apply the horizontal load on the SRB belly bands during stacking? In other words, how did you, you what did you use to pull on them? Yeah, well, that's a, thank you for asking that question. You know, uh, it, the belly bands, are, are they, they, we have the load cells tied to the facility to the and uh, and and I think I came up with analytically with something like around fifteen thousand pounds pull on these belly bands. Okay. That was enough to deflect a little bit, you know, uh, the SRBs. So when you rig those struts, they compress the tank a little bit. Okay. Not enough to crinkle it at room temperature. Okay. If you if you stretch the SRBs too far, that was tricky. I mean, we are getting into a technical aspects here. About 25 years after I've done it, but <laughs> but it was traumatic enough that I remember about 15,000 pounds pull deflect the SRBs enough to to create a compressive load just enough so that when you shrink later, you look like a circle, not like an ellipsis. And you don't crinkle the dome in the meantime at room temperature. There was, a, there, was, there was more trickery involved that I described here. So that was a good question. This question actually is, an, uh, is a nice uh, segue into this one. Um, how, did, how does SENI team test solutions? So they came up, for example, with the belly, maybe not belly bands, but when an SENI team develops a system-wide solution yeah. that they think might work, how do they yeah. test it to make sure yeah. it does? The, the, main tool, the main tool for system integration is analytical capability. And like I said, you can analyze, you know, for a small fraction of, of, of design of the hardware. But if you come up with a solution such as we offered, you have to analyze and analyze and analyze mm -hmm. all the undesirable impacts that you're creating by solving one problem. Like, you know, this flying, flying the whole shuttle and minus 3.2 3 degrees through max Q. Mm -hmm. you, I can tell you countless analysis we do to make sure we because now we are creating a new design requirement for the shuttle without having any intention of redesigning. So you have to make sure that original design is still consistent with this new, new set of loads that you get yes. while flying at 3.2 degree angle of attack. So my, our major tool was analysis 
although occasionally we will do we would do tests, system level tests. Okay. You know, like I give you one example, and and this is not on my ship. This is uh, on on Apollo. P people, you know, uh, people had an, a, a uh, Saturn V in VAB, and they pushed it. Put it excited in the first oscillatory or vibration mode to check the first modal frequency of the of the stack, mm -hmm. and it was a very simple test. People actually used their tennis shoes on their feet to try to periodically push on the rocket. Very simple, you know. Not everything has to be complicated, you know. It was a very simple test, but this, but we do it rarely. Typically. We do verify our proposed solutions by analysis. Okay, so and this is a nice enough, another segue into this question about okay. testing versus analysis. From an SCNI standpoint, can you assess the shuttle program decision to fly a manned STS-1 mission without a full unmanned test flight? Boy, that's a that's a that's a show the in-depth thinking on the part of the person who asked that. Uh, this was Brian. Okay, very good. Well, Brian, uh, and you know what? S some things you do, and for example, Russians, you know, Russians flew unmanned, their shuttle unmanned. It, it, it barely survived, and, and they never flew it. Again, Perestroika happened, so that went away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, it, Perception was at the beginning of shuttle that the safest thing, for example, you know, we had uh, ejection sheets for, for, the, for the first shuttle, which were eliminated promptly because we thought it was impractical. And we had actually at the beginning of the program, for better or for worse, we had a lot of confidence until Charlie and Hepper in, in the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. We had, I mean, Believe me, Challenger was a wake-up for all of us. You know, without benefit, I shouldn't call it benefit, my God, if, if it was anything, it was bad. But until Challenger happened, we thought we had a very safe vehicle. And decision to put uh, John Young and Crippen on the first flight, uh, if we had known we were heading to our Challenger, I don't know what, we, what NASA you know, would have done and what we would have been recommending to NASA. But that's a very good question. That's a, like almost a soul-searching question. Yeah. But you know what? Challenger happened. Then Columbia happened. You see, the problem is that uh, you don't know where you're heading. You, you, uh, Tommy Holloway, a very good friend of mine who, who was uh, one of the early uh, program managers on Space Shuttle, he, always, he, told, he said something that I have repeated we were not as smart as we thought we were. Hmm. And you know what? For you guys working on today's program, please keep that in mind. Confidence is wonderful. We were humbled by, 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 by being confident and having a blind spot in our knowledge. So I don't know how to answer that question directly, but I think I've said enough. It's a very deep question. And, uh, and maybe with what we knew at the STS one time frame, maybe that was the right decision. Hmm. Let me ask you another question about SENI solutions. Um, can you talk a little bit about how long an SENI team might take to work through their process to come up with a solution? Well, that's a, that's a perfectly valid question. You know, some, some things are simple. This, this, uh, discovering that canting a whole shuttle 3.2 degrees mm -hmm. solves the wing problem. I would say that was of order of four or five months, okay. you know. Uh, but, but we had another SCNI dilemma is flying through, which I didn't talk about here, flying through high, uh, through high, uh, through dynamic, high dynamic pressure from point of view of creating structural load independent of this wing problem I described. That one took us almost 10 years to come up with a really good solution. Hmm. We were making Band-Aids over on Band-Aids on Band-Aids. And I have talked about this many times. But we finally came with, the, after 10 years, we came with this 
so-called day of lo launch high load update. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with that, where you actually measure the winds on the day of launch, just before launch, and 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 put a tr in the compute bunch of constants and put them in the guidance system, mm -hmm. which will guide you to fly through that particular wind. Hmm. That was that solution development of that solution took us ten years. Okay. But in the meantime, we were flying with those different band aids. Yeah. So those weren't mission so, cr critical. Oh well, sure. Those are the things that uh, that. Uh, uh, that control the amount of structural load you experience during while flying through high dynamic pressure region, you know. Okay. But that's a very good question. They're not all the same. You know, sometimes you, you have a weeks of analysis and, and you, you solve the problem. That could tend a uh, tilting we vehicle, it took uh, uh, four or five four months. months. Doing my goofy uh, belly bend stretching the SRB probably took me about three, four weeks. And I still remember uh, coming home at night about 10 o'clock and my wife being a little upset, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here's another question. Um, can you, from a project management perspective, uh, can you think of an example where a lessons learned item was incorporated into some systems engineering and integration solution? Well, I tell you what, we, uh, there, are, there are several things. For example, during the liftoff event of the space shuttle, we had this, this problem, annoying, languishing problem called stud hang up. The shuttle solid booster, each solid booster is held up by big bulk, stud we call them, you know, with a big knot on top of it that gets broken by pyrotechnics at liftoff. And we had this, uh, and, and, you know, and we always worried, he said, well, when you fly, and that stud, by the way, is supposed to get ejected so that you have a clean liftoff. We had repeatedly, uh, I don't know how many times, but it must have been probably a couple of dozen times, we had these stud hang-ups, and, and there was sort of the shuttle were lifting off while in contact with that big bolt, and, I, you know, in uh, I, that problem, that, that was a lesson learned that was used to design the, the SLS. They don't have the stud. They have clamps. Hmm. The clamps open up and you're free to fly. Nice solution. There is a very nice example, you know, where uh, experience in this, and this is very interactive. It's a ground system in contact with the vehicle through this bolt while while vehicle is lifting through probably first foot or so of its travel, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not a good thing. And we always worry, what if, what if several of those balls hang up? Are we going to have a problem lifting off properly, you know? But that problem was resolved in SLS, and they have a clamp. They don't have these, these uh, studs. Okay. Um, I have uh, a question about uh, project performance analysis. Can you speak to the ways that project performance analysis is used by an SE&I team? No, I can't. We, we did not. We, I think what the person was referring to performance measurement system. And we, I have been exposed to it uh, later in my career. But during uh, when I was doing the SE&I, we did not. And that was probably already known by some people, maybe in military program. We did not use um, uh, th that measurement system, so I can't really talk about that. Okay. So what advice, and, uh, here's a question from Susan, excuse me. Uh, what advice do you have for young professionals so that they may take a systems approach to their project? Yeah. Th this, is, uh, th I, this is a wonderful question. Don't get, as, if, even if you love structural dynamics, that's what I did, structural dynamics. Don't get trapped in the stovepipe called structural dynamics. Start looking around, broadening yourself, broaden your, your outlook. If you, you can spend all your career in, you know, in, 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 a, in a technical discipline, and I just use structural dynamics as, a, as my example. The quicker you learn about system engineering and system engineering mentality that you might develop, 
I believe that the, 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 the more enjoyable and better career you will enjoy. And, and one other thought for you. System engineering and integration is frequently not very well understood, even by very senior management. So if you walk into the room and, and show system engineering savvy, you will make impression, believe me because you, you may be a rare individual in that room. So my, my advice is learn about, embrace, and practice system engineering in whatever you do, whether you do or don't want to be a project manager. It will, it will help your career and make it more rewarding. Now, in other conversations, I've heard you talk about, your, describe yourself as a systems integrator as opposed to describing yourself as a project manager or program manager. In your eyes, what's the difference between being a systems integrator and being a project manager? Well, you know, if it's, okay, it's, I, I like to think of myself, I've done a little bit of both, okay? System integration is, is, is more of the system level view of the technical prob problem. When you are a, a project manager, you have an, some more dimensions added to your job. Like you have to worry about budget. You have to worry about schedule. You don't only look at, at the uh, most engineering, most effective engineering solution. You have to look at affordability. Can I afford it? Do I have enough lifetime left in my career or in, my, in the project's life to be able to do it? So the project management is broader than, than, than system engineering, but it, but it should include system engineering as one of the essential tools. Okay. Now, you have a lot of experience talking with engineers. So this question has to do with helping engineers who, as yeah. we've talked before, are very, um, like to solve the problems that are right in front of them. If, how can you, as a program manager or project manager, help engineers see a bigger picture instead of trying to solve the problem in their system or subsystem? Well, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's almost cultural. If the guy at the top has a system mentality and encourages that in others, that's what they'll do. I remember when I first came to Rockwell, and this is a, a, a funny, uh, it's not all that uh, well demonstrating what we are talking about. The guy who was in charge of engineering smoked a pipe. This is where we could smoke pipe, you know, in the offices. <laughs> Suddenly, I looked around, and everybody was walking around the floor was smoking pipes. It was, it was smoking pipes. That's a different time and age. And I tell you, what, what, it, what, what it showed me at that time, the guys at the top defined the culture. People, emul people imitated. And whether it's, it's silly pipe smoking or something more important, the guy at the top defines what the behavior of a team is frequently. So, you know, if you, if you want to encourage young people to think broadly, you have to, you, first of all, you have to encourage them. Mm -hmm. Don't ridicule them if they are wrong, and they will be wrong sometimes. We all have been, you know. And promote, promote, recognize people who do, who, who provide you a system level solutions and, and acknowledge that. And, and, and I think if you cultivate a culture of system engineering usefulness, I think it will, it will work for you. So we have it will work for the young people. It will work for your program. We have a couple more questions, but I'll remind viewers watching, if you want to submit a question for Bo to answer, you can submit that by using the thought bubble in the lower right-hand corner of the virtual PM challenge player or you could submit it using the hashtag AskVPMC using your preferred social media. So I have a question here about the systems focus mindset. Yes. Uh, can the same systems mindset that was used on shuttle be applied today to complex missions like Orion? Well, <laughs> first of all, complexity of the shuttle when it comes to system integration was greater than, than complexity of Orion slash SLS system. Mm -hmm. Orion has a different role. We were flying to low Earth orbit. Orion has some additional functionality that, that talks about, you know, long mission duration, deep space, radiation, stuff that we didn't have to worry about. 
so there are some some differences but i i believe that principles of system engineering and integration that we used are being used to some extent and can be used successfully in orion sls and ground systems on today's program mm -hmm. yeah just remember this chart that I th still might be on, on the screen. Shuttle, SLS, Orion, Sea Launch, they look different. They, they, their purpose is a little different. Sometimes it's much different. They all use basic engineering SENI functions to, to be built and operated. Okay. Here's a question, and I apologize if I mispronounce the name, from Payman, and they want your technical advice. Oh my goodness. All right. Yeah. So on the tactical level. Uh, technical or tactical? tactical? Tactical. Excuse me. Okay. Can you please share your experience on how to approach the design of a complex device uh, comprising many hardware and software modules from the SE standpoint? The goal being to try and have a device that's efficiently developed and successful at launch. You know, you just you, you just answered your own question. It's system engineering approach. The more complex, the more distributed among different people who build it, design it and build it, the more you need robust system engineering and integration. Mm -hmm. The more com you know complexity alone, but complexity coupled with uh, with distribu distribution of effort among different entities with different technical cultures scream for, for, for more robust system engineering and integration. And shuttle was not a bad example. Shuttle, shuttle was complex. You know, for ex I'll give you a simple function. Just, just give you one uh, example. Pressurization of external tank. You know, you blow some hot gases to keep the tank pressurized in flight. Mm -hmm. The gas the hot gases were produced by engine. The control how much of these hot gases flow to the tank was done by orbiter. Tank was on the receiving side stating how much of these gases do I need to maintain pressure. And if it's too much, they had a vent valve that would open and vent it if, if it was, let's say, exceeded. Here are three elements. You know, this is a highly integrated system. And all it does is pressurize the tank, you know. So here's a, a, an example of uh, shuttle. If you look at the shuttle as a complex system, was probably as complex as uh, maybe one day when we go to these distant missions and we start doing, you know, asteroid retrieval or going to m uh, Martian moon or whatever, complexity will, will take a new colors. Mm -hmm. But with today's technology, what we have done to date, Probably shuttle is as complex from integration point of view as we have had anything we have attempted. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, earlier you gave some advice to young professionals. If you could go back in time and give yourself any advice, if you go back in time to when you started your career as an aerospace engineer, as a systems engineer, what kind of advice do you think that you would give yourself? <laughs> Boy. You know, uh, well, I, you see, I came to America in 1960. Mm -hmm. I couldn't speak English, you know. I, I, and uh, so uh, I, went to, I went to University of Colorado, and I, you know, I graduated, finally had to go to work. And, uh, and, 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 and I don't know if, if I was lucky or, or I was just in right place, you know, at the right time. Uh, because I've talked to many young people who came to me and said, well, how the, what did you have to do to, uh, to, to get, become program manager, let's say, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was not, an easy, uh, was not easy to, uh, to answer. And if you don't know why it happened, uh, I'm not sure I could, <laughs> I could tell myself, how would I make it differently or better? I don't know that I want to answer the question. I really don't know. I like my life, you know? I made a lot of friends at NASA. I made a lot of friends in the industry. Uh, I've done something productive. Uh, for a guy who came from, uh, you know, communist country here to this great nation of ours, I like what I have done, and I'm not sure that I'd, if I had a chance to give myself advice, I don't know if I would know what, what advice to give. 
I like what happened with my life. You know? <laughs> I know you have and some. And I'm not uh, undermining the value of the question. I think it's a good question, but I'm, I'm giving you an honest answer. Go ahead. I appreciate that. I, I know you have, you have some final takeaways for us. Yeah. I have, I have one more chart left that we can, uh, if we are running short, uh, exhausting question. Is you, you were wonderful, you know, you're a captive audience and you're not in this room, so, so in that sense, you, you, you make it easy for me, although I do appreciate your question. Uh, but, but I have one more chart that sort of summarizes a little bit and maybe, maybe give you a little bit of a takeaway. Number one is, you know, I hope I have made, impressed you with the fact that every major, and it's not only major, the more major, the more complex, the more distributed it is, the more it needs robust SENI program. I hope that, that, is, uh, that you, you, I have your agreement on that. And, you know, I've, I've showed you only three examples. You know, we had eight-hour session. I don't know if I could do it, now, number <laughs> one. <laughs> but I could probably give you, a, uh, you know, 50 examples that system approach to problem resolution gives you a great potential for most effective corrective action. If you have a stress problem in some in one isolated area and all you need to do is strengthen the bracket, strengthen the bracket. If you have a half of the vehicle where you have load exceedances, Try to find a more effective solution than strengthening half of the vehicle. And we did 3.2 degree angle of attack in flight. It solved the problem. That was a system level solution to a system level approach to problem resolution. So to me, that number two is extremely important. And you know, we haven't flown a lot since Shuttle. And to, to you folks working on ESD, on SLS, on Orion, and ground side, you will be, I hope you don't suffer through the problems we did, but you will have problems. You know, and SE and I should be there with you to look at the solution beyond where they occur, beyond the local area where you see a problem like we did. And the number three on this chart, developing a system culture in program management key to successful execution. You know, program manager, if you embrace the system approach in your program, people will follow you. People will do, do the same. If you, if you don't appreciate SENI, likewise, people will take the same path. If you want to be successful in your program, I suggest that you as a program manager fully embrace SENI and use it. Use it to help you be successful and save your, you know, save your program problems. And the final is your own system level mentality is likely to enhance your career. Like I told, said earlier, you walk in the room full of guys uh, working in their stove pipe environment and you shine with the system level knowledge, you will be noticed. Thank you, Bo. Wise words. That brings us to the end of today's session of NASA's virtual PM challenge. Uh, today's session was made possible by a number of people and organizations. I want to make sure to thank NASA Langley Research Center for hosting us, as well as the protocol office. I also want to thank NASA's Engineering and Safety Center. And Bo, I want to thank you for sharing your insights about my, how, my how, pleasure. how systems it engineering and integration. It was enjoyable. It was nice to okay. hear how systems engineering and integration can assist with project management. Thank you. We'll be back in a couple of months with the next virtual PM challenge session where we'll kick off the 2016 season. Until then, be well and thank you for joining us this afternoon.